Okay, so mm -hmm. um, so we should start then. Um, yes, please. Okay, so this session will be recorded. Uh, hello, my name is Ali, and the uh, coordinator for um, uh, Umran Academic Research Association, and uh, we are conducting. We are we have organized this um, talk. The topic is war violence, distorted identity, reading. Tahmima Anam, and uh, the speaker will be Ankita Dube. Uh, she is doing PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University, and she is also uh, assistant professor at Lady Sri Ram uh, College for women. Uh, and um, so, so um, the part of the uh, University of Delhi. And uh, um, we have a moderator, uh, Fatma Sahar. Uh, and uh, she has uh, recently completed her PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University uh, from the Department of uh, English Studies. And um, uh, she has been um, a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Texas. Uh, I'm sorry. And uh, she has been a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Texas um, at Austin, uh, United States in 2017 and 18. Uh, she has uh, uh, been also a visiting PhD scholar uh, at the University of Tübingen, uh, Germany. And uh, she will be uh, the moderator for this session. So without further ado, I would like to invite both of you, uh, Fatma, who will be moderating this session, and Ankita Dube, thank you very much, and nice to see you. So, floor is, floor is yours, Fatma. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, thank you, everyone associated with UARA, Umran Academic Research Association. I am very pleased to be here today, and I welcome all of you. A very good evening to all of you. Take it as it suits you, if you are in America, or in Turkey, or in Iran, or in India. Uh, I welcome all of you for today's webinar on uh, on a Bangladeshi British writer Tahmima Anam. So I will just give you a brief overview about her, and then we will move. Uh, you got me. Yeah. Tahmima is a Bangladeshi British writer, and her first novel is A Golden Age followed by The Good Muslim and The Bones of Grace. Uh, these three novels form her Bengal trilogy, in which we see the literary representation of the birth of Bangladesh, and also uh, eventually its failure. This becomes even more pertinent today as we see more and more wars happening around us. Russia's Ukraine invasion, military invasion, uh, uh, people fleeing for their safety, children, adults, old people, uh, everyone crying for their lives. This is the paraphernalia of any war, not just in Ukraine, but anywhere in the world. And today we will see how at the backdrop of this fictional work uh, by Anam, by Tahmima Anam, we see the 1971 war of liberation and the birth of Bangladesh. So Ankita will discuss more about it. Ankita, now the floor is yours. A very warm welcome. And now please, you may thank begin you. now. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, and Rajiv, thank you for a lovely introduction. And uh, to my audience, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for this talk. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll just, you know, uh, without taking you know, much time, I'll just begin with my talk. So. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you must have you know, seen the, uh, or, you know, gone through the abstract of uh, my lecture. So the title of my uh, talk today is War, Violence and Distorted Identity, Reading Tahmima Anam. So in my talk, I'll uh, you know, primarily focus on Anam's novel, uh, which is, as you know, uh, Fatima just you know, mentioned, uh, a part of her, you know, Bengal, uh, the trilogy, you know, Bengal trilogy that she uh, <clears throat> Uh, wrote and um, through a textual analysis of you know, this novel, I intend to argue how, how you know Anam 
uh, questions, you know, different aspects of, you know, identity formation and uh, violence that's, you know, intertwined in the nation building process um, and also it's, you know, afterwards. So the novel, uh, you know, tries to uh, reinvent, tries to, you know, retell the violent history of the Bangladesh Liberation War. And um, to some extent, the text also, you know, intervenes in the dialectic of the secular and the sacred by scrutinizing the extremity of both in dictating the national identity of an individual. Uh, so the novel metaphorically presents uh, this conflicting situation of the newly built nation of Bangladesh uh, through the skirmishes visible in the sibling relationship of a family. So whatever is happening in the outside in the political world, the family is very much, you know, symbolic, or you can say uh, the family itself, you know, produces an allegory of the political, you can say, uh, life of Bangladesh. Um, so the characters uh, in her novel, uh, we have the entire, you know, uh, uh, novel is you know, narrated from the perspective of you know, these two siblings, uh, Maya and Sohei. And uh, the novel you know, primarily focuses on how these characters, uh, they brutally you know, portray the cost the ordinary citizens paid in the war for liberation, uh, obviously, which affected their lives beyond repair. Uh, the sudden you know, surge of nation towards secularism threw it into the state of political volatility as it came into head-on collision with the pro-Islamic sentiment of the population. So if you focus on the first wave literature, uh, you know, which came from Bangladesh, that was primarily imbued in the songs of heroic celebration of war and the freedom it proclaimed for itself. So uh, the selective representation of the liberation movement simply, you know, suppressed the narratives of discontent, narratives of trauma and discrimination. Not only this, it also covered up the state-sponsored tactic of violent secularism as well as violent fundamentalism. The novel, therefore, marks major intervention in the Bangladeshi literary arena by raising questions as to if religious fundamentalism is a kind of anti-state sentiment which harnesses violence and hatred, what about the process of assertive secularism which equally threatens to control the private religious practices of um, people. The paper therefore, you know, argues that extremity of both these ideologies has battered both the public as well as private lives of the citizens. So for a society which is deeply embedded in the culture, rituals um, and practices of Islam, forced secularism only seems to you know, beget conflict. So here, uh, if, you if you focus on the plot of the uh, novel, the plot is centered on the ideological war that uh, erupts inside the family between Maya and Sohail. And this ideological war is very much you know, symbolic of the outside world of religious and political uncertainty of Bangladesh. Now, after gaining independence, the <clears throat> country struggled to find a synergy between the Bengali and Islamic identity. While Maya does not sever her attachment with the secular Bengali culture and language, Sohail goes under complete transition of personality and becomes a pro-Muslim, practicing all the religious doctrines the holy book teaches him. During the war, both Maya and Sohail, they actively took part uh, in the struggle for freedom. They willingly became active members of the Mukti Bahini group, which was the major guerrilla resistance group engaged in the fight for the formation of Bangladesh. As students of Dhaka University, and Dhaka back then was the hub of the movement, both siblings, they shared the mutual vision of a secular free nation devoid of any religious or fundamentalist hegemony. But in the years following the war, we see these characters taking two completely opposite ideological standpoints as defining markers of a true Bangladeshi. The novel opens in the year 1984, and we get a glimpse into Maya's homecoming to Dhaka after almost you know, seven years. Um, uh, and and you know, these seven years she, she spent in a remote village where she was you know, working as a doctor for peasants in Pua. So her decision to leave her house seven years ago was propelled by her failure to fight Sohail's transformation. The narrative opens in the present, but keeps moving back and forth in time in order for the characters to introspect their own limitations and extremisms. The frequent shifting of story from present to past opens up the space to see the characters in their bare vulnerabilities. As a country that is still reeling from the effects of the nine month uh, war against Pakistan, Anam's use of the different time settings outline the, uh, outline the changing trajectories of the nation. So from jubilation, euphoria, and triumph of liberation, the country is now thrown into a period of political uncertainty. Now, after coming back to home, Maya keeps recalling the years of her brother's return from war. 
his sudden turn towards religious fundamentalism and her inability to accommodate his changes, which ultimately caused family feud and forced Maya to leave the house. After returning from war, we see Sohail in a completely disillusioned state because he is not able to find a new purpose in life. His question to Maya, what will we do now, I wonder, indicates the futility of war and how it brutally affected the citizens both individually and collectively. The narrator in the story builds up this state of tension that soon uh, tears apart the relationship of the characters in the family. I'm quoting from the text. That night on the porch with her brother back from the war, Maya believed their waiting days were over. She watched her mother spread her prayer mat, face west, and thank God for his return, imagining the future rolling out in front of, in front of them as flat and endless and predictable as the Delta. How wrong she had been. After seven years of her life as a crusading doctor, Maya returns home more stronger and revolutionary in spirit, while Sohail turns into a devout imam by becoming a member of the Tablighi Jamaat, uh, which is a religious proselytizing organization, um, uh, and it tries to you know, preach ultra-Orthodox Islamic practices in order to convert non-believers into believers of one true faith. So he cut, cuts himself off from the outside world and finds recluse in the rooftop room of his house where a congregation of devout Muslims are organized every day. The once rebellious guerrilla fighter is now transformed into a holy man preaching people values of Islam. His blind, his blind submission to the services of the Jamaat turns him away from the elusive world of politics, family and friends. After his wife Sylvie dies, who herself was a staunch believer of Islamic orthodoxy, he is left with the sole responsibility of his six years uh, old only son Zaid. But due to his undivided involvement in the prayer services, both at the mosque and at home, he neglects his familial duties. His devotion and religious jealousness pushes him away from the worldly attachment and slowly he becomes so pragmatic that he does not even spare a moment to mourn his wife's death. Coming home, Maya thinks of the expectations with which she and her brother as college students had participated in the War of Freedom. How they used to read together Ibsen, Fitzgerald, Tagore, Marx, how Sohail's hunger for such books would push him to the extent of stealing them from the library. How they would dream together of a free, unorthodox and modern nation. But the fact that the gap between the siblings increased to such a level that she abandoned her house, her old mother, over the night for a period of seven long years, addresses the unexpected wave of calamity that the years after independence brought to their lives. The idea of home also becomes contested in her memory, which once used to be a safe place, safe place to harbor her knowledge and freedom of thought. Standing at the door of her house, Maya ruminates, and I'm quoting from the text, she had loved this house once, lost into the bone of this house was every thought and hope and bewildered fantasy she had ever harbored about her life. About the war she had fought and won, about the woman and man she had imagined she and her brother would become. But after, all, but after it was all over, the killing and the truce and the redrawing of the border, he had gone one way and she another and she had foreseen none of it. Certainly, Maya and Sohail's fragile relation reflects the conflict that Bangladesh was undergoing in the process of consolidating state power. The two siblings resemble the extremities of their respective ideologies by plainly perceiving each other's views as illogical and obtrusive. If for, if for Maya, Sohail's transition is a kind of religious extremism which turns him away from everything that is modern, liberal, and secular, for Sohail, Maya's liberal belief system is symbolic of secular fundamentalism, which attempts to intervene unnecessarily in the private choices, faith, and religious practices of an individual. Neither of them are tolerant enough to accept one another for who they were once and who they have become now without trapping themselves into the binary of the threatened self and the threatening other. Daniel O'Conkill studies the terms religious fundamentalism and secular fundamentalism not as opposites, but as identical in the way they premise the normative understanding of categories such as you know, religious, anti-religious, non-religious as truth that is rigid, absolute, and uncontested. Both these doctrines compete to bracket out their counterparts as fanatic, dogmatic, and extreme. The former is motivated by the agenda of describing religion as a channelizing force in the public domain. The latter, on the other hand, endeavors to pull out religion from the public domain and make it a private truth devoid of any kind of political significance. 
Their claims to a competing understanding of absolute truth remain contradictory to each other, but they function on the similar rhetoric of self-contained epistemic system. And this is, you know, how Conkill, uh, you know, uh, describes these two, uh, you know, terms, religious and secular fundamentalism. He says these are, these two concepts are systems of thought that are both insulated and insular, that is both shielded and isolated from competing understandings of truth. Likewise, each depends on a type of faith. The faith of religious fundamentalists is the acceptance of truths without regard to competing claims of reason. The faith of comprehensive uh, secular fundamentalists is that without reason, there is nothing. So Hale and Maya stand at these two sides of fundamentalism so rigidly that even their connection through Rehana and Zayed fails to sustain their relationship for a long time. Both showcase their own sides of ideological bigotry, the price for which is obviously paid by the tragic death of Zayel towards the end of the novel. Maya fails to accept the new identity of Sohail and keeps mocking him for who he has become. Sohail fails to connect to Maya as she only wants stories of heroism. She wants him to tell her that he planted bombs under Country Bridge and that the Fell Bridge cut off the army and the people of North uh, Tangail and Bogra were saved. All this while, what Sohail wishes to tell her is, I have committed murder. What causes this change of nature in him is the murder he committed of an uh, you know, Urdu speaking innocent old man who was not a soldier or a Bihari or any kind of enemy. Uh, the madness of, you know, that, that is where, you know, he feels uh, what, you know, war does to you. The madness of war and violence, uh, uh, you know, back then had got hold of his mind so strongly that he killed him only for letting out the wrong word out of his mouth. Now, what is this, you know, wrong word? As the narrator tells us, this was the kalma, bismillah, irrahman, irrahim. He feels compassion. I mean, the first emotion that I'm, when he looks at this, you know, old man uh, and the old man, when he calls him beta, uh, the first emotion that he feels is that of, you know, compassion, that of, you know, sympathy. Uh, but it is the utterance of the kalma uh, that in the very next moment tags him as his enemy, as his other. So the weight of you know, this guilt makes him uh, hollow from inside and he considers himself as one of those war criminals who killed innocent people in the name of religion. This memory weighs heavily on his consciousness and his turn to religion becomes a medium for desperate redemption. So the same man who once used to tell his friends how religion can blind them in their way to attain freedom and would strictly prohibit the recitation of kalma during their days of guerrilla training now argues in the favor of religion by saying it is not a bad thing to find one's God. Maya views Sohail's part in the war for freedom as a sign of velour, but for Sohail, this velour is heavily loaded with the tragic memories of war, the people he lost and the people he killed. She rem Maya remains hungrily eager to devour every detail of war from her brother's mouth, who, on the contrary, wants her to be simply quiet so she can hear the roar in his head, thinking that if she could hear that roar, the roar of uncertainty and the roar of death, she might understand the buried pain in his heart. So the only mode of communication that exists between the two afterwards is silence for silence. The glimpse of this otherization can be seen in the way Maya ridicules the newfound identity of Sohail and mocks the absurdity, absurdity, of, absurdity of religion. I'm quoting from the text, uh, the narrator tells us, uh, this was her moment, she had thought of it so often, it was a dream, he could see himself reflected through her eyes, see the absurdity of what he had become. He would see the ugliness of turning his family away, the cruelty of his own fathering. Cracks would appear in his belief, his fate would be shaken. Not in the Almighty, she would not wish to take that away from him. Or perhaps she did, but she was not willing to admit it. But in whatever force had taken him from her and delivered up a stranger. To her, uh, to Maya, finding uh, escape into the fold of religion makes people irrational and blind believers. She claims that it is religion only that led her country to war and violence. When Sohail tries to persuade her defensively about this new newfound love for religion, that um, that is, you know, what prayer is, it is the abandonment of all other thoughts, all other pursuits. Maya reminds him of the atrocities of war by saying, you remember, don't you, what they did to us in the name of God? Unlike Sohail, who thinks just because a handful of people wrongly used religion, a tool to commit violence, does not mean that religion itself is violent. Maya interprets religion as a kind of frenzy that kills one's power to reason. That is why when war ends, we see Maya's non-religious identity still so intact because 
you know, as the narrator you know, implies in the text, Maya had taught herself away from faith. She had unlearned, this, unlearned the surahs her mother had recited aloud. Uh, she had erased from her memory all knowledge of the sacred, returned her body to a time before it had been taught to me to prostrate, to prostrate itself because of all the things she had witnessed committed in the name of God. Her critical outlook towards religion pushes her to perceive things either as right or as wrong. This has been the problem with the secular nationalist thinking that they lack the ability to see common people's involvement in the, in the war as a way of resistance towards certain way of practicing Islam and not towards the religion of Islam. People fought for their survival, they fought for their autonomy, they fought for their freedom and not simply to shun their religious identity. Their resistance and hatred were directed towards the illegitimate, illegitimate killing and coercion of the people all under the banner of Islam by the West Pakistan. The novel also proclaims this fact that for the people of Bangladesh, Islam is so much a part of their social cultural life that imagining a nation rid of this religious identity will be nearly impossible. As Sanjay Bhardwaj, you know, uh, opines, uh, Islamic traditions and customs, institutions and beliefs are reckoned as the only familiar forms of social being and consciousness in Bangladeshi society. Uh, Maya, uh, you know, uh, loses any sense of empathy towards her brother only because he takes up a path which does not align with hers. Whenever he tries to express his own views on how religion offers him the solace and that uh, he needs to unburden himself of his own guilt, she simply dismisses it immediately by saying, don't start talking religious mumbo jumbo. We won't recognize you anymore. In her heart, she knows that the holy book is helping Sohel in recuperating from past trauma. But what she discards is his absolute dependency on it that comes at the cost of his filial responsibilities. For a strong liberal woman like Maya, who herself lost her father to war and had been witness to the brutality inflicted on the body of Bangladeshi women by the East Pakistani fanatics, it all looked like uh, the last recourse of a weak, submissive man who is unable to collect his own strength and rise above the chains of such haunting memories. Um, so in this you know, vague attempt to pull her brother out from the dirt of religion, she, she begins to close any possibility of understanding between them. She tries to own him as she thinks. She can do something to prevent it. She believes um, her will is greater than the leaf in her heart and the leaf in her brother's. Uh, this is where, you know, again, you know, Daniel Conkill, um, he attempts to you know, explain this ideological, you know, polarization by you know, saying, on one side are religious fundamentalists who, assuming they bring their religion to bear on public issues, regard it as the only legitimate source of truth on whatever issues it addresses. On the other are secular fundamentalists who embrace an entirely different source of truth, one that excludes religious thought as illegitimate. Each group resides in its own world of truth. These worlds are isolated from each other and their inhabitants cannot communicate across the divide. Secularism therefore you know, marks a clear distinction between the private and the political and allows different cultural and religious practices to be practiced in private by an individual until they do not struggle, until they uh, do not struggle to seek recognition uh, uh, in the state politics. Under this distinction, what kind of practices the state allows or restricts from being considered as private republic is again a game of power. Undoubtedly, a secular society provides a space for disagreement on the matter of political principles. But this, but this space is generally filled up by rules of negotiation, persuasion, and compromise between the contending parties. These rules are always established by the state to enforce the standards of legitimization in a secular society. Uh, Talal Assad, providing an insight into this hegemony construct of secularism, writes, negotiation simply amounts to the exchange of unequal concessions in a situation where the weaker party has no choice. What happens, citizens ask, to the principles of equality and liberty in the secular imaginary when they are subjected to the necessities of law. According to him, absolutist approach to any kind of uh, ideology, be it secular or religious, is always dangerous, as it can easily push people to the brink of extremism. Uh, so here, you know, uh, we see Sohail, uh, uh, you know, he uh, constantly you know, tries to make peace with his past and the present self, but Maya refuses to do this for him. She recalls the pre-war image of Sohail, which obviously had been the opposite of the image of a religious man. This constant comparison of the pre-war and post-war identity of Sohail pushes Maya to think that his conversion is fragile and momentary, and she and that you know she has the right to sort of you know change him. 
So his adherence to the power of religion, uh, power of religion, blinds him from the practicality of the outside world. He believes more in the hidden mystery of Islam than in the importance of science and modernity. This kind of radical attitude proves dangerous, as we see it in the case of Sylvie, who his wife, uh, who died because of untreated jaundice and the decision of Sohail to not to you know send her to hospital. Uh, for Sohail, it is only Islamic rituals and prayer services that have the power to treat a person of any physical as well as psychological ailment. This radical faith in the supremacy of Islam leads to the tragic death of Sylvie, and with that, the tragic life, therefore, of the child Zed. Not learning from his wife's death, Sohail continues on the same path, which ultimately has a catastrophic result for his family. In every kind of scientific, medical, and educational discussion, religion becomes his, his safeguard. That is why whenever Maya tries to argue with reason, Sohail has religion at his side to defend him. The book burning episode uh, in the novel stands as the ultimate moment in Sohail's life from which there is no turning back. His transformation finds, it com finds its completion in this incident, uh, where we see him you know, packing all his books of philosophy and literature uh, and that's when, you know, Maya comes to convince him uh, to not to, you know, sort of do that by singing Tagore's song with the hope that the lyrics will resurrect his rebellious self. But to her utter shock, Sohail responds by burning all his books in Hitler's style and thus blocks it, every possibility of communication between um, uh, the two. Now, the question arises whether this action of Sohail comes as naturally in that moment, or is it the continuous pressure from Maya to change his thought that results in the sudden display of anger? Rihanna, uh, who, who is uh, the mother of you know, uh, Maya and Sohail, her reaction at the sight of book burning conveys that it is Maya's disapproval and constant denial of Sohail's converted identity that pushes him to this, to this extent. She rebukes Maya by saying, you pushed him, you pushed and pushed, you mocked him, you turned deaf and you mocked him, you led him here calling him a mullah, you could not stand for him to be different. Since that night, everything in the house changed for the worst. The way Anam describes the birth of Jayad after two months of that incident describes the hollowness of the world to which he is being you know, brought to. Uh, as the narrator you know, mentions, Jayad was born, brought into the world by a midwife whose face was covered by a piece of black netting. He opened his eyes to that, an empty space where the welcoming love should happen. This emptiness lurks in his life forever as soon as he loses his mother and almost lives like a fatherless son who is least bothered about his needs and desires. What turns out to be the worst is Sohail's imposition of Islamic laws over his son. Um, uh, he makes it you know, um, compulsory for the child to dress according to uh, Islamic tradition. Uh, he deprives him uh, of you know, um, all sorts of, you know, things which usually sort of, you know, children of this age, uh, they look for, you know, they are pampered, they have, you know, parents try to, you know, give them a comfortable life, right? But then here we have uh, this child who is not given toys, no pocket money, no sandals. Uh, and that is why, you know, he picks up the habit of stealing food from market shops and money from his aunt's wallet. When he goes out with his mother, grandmother or aunt, he easily gets tempted by delicious food uh, put on display in shops as because, you know, such kind of, you know, temptation is prohib prohibited to him uh, from an early uh, age. Maya feels, uh, uh, you know, angry as well as, you know, she also uh, has this, you know, sense of you know, sympathy for the child when she takes him out with her to buy sandals for him, uh, you know, one day and the shopkeeper addresses him as a servant boy. This embarrasses her and in her anger, she scolds him, uh, you know, for being so shabbily dressed. She saw the way, uh, you know, he breathed through his mouth and the caked mucus in the corners of his eyes. He did look like a servant boy. That's what, you know, Maya uh, thought in that moment. His collars rimmed with gray short scabs dotting his forearms. In another episode, when she asks the child if he knows his alphabet, by which she means Bengali alphabet, alphabet he replies, Alif Bartasa. Since Zaid's education is done entirely under the supervision of Islamic tradition, he is well familiar with Arabic and Urdu language, but then has no acquaintance with his own, uh, with his own, you know, uh, language. The quality and religious madness of Sohail is seen in the scene where he decides to send Zaid away to Madarsa in Chandpur to teach him the virtues of a good Muslim under the guidance of the Huzur, who is the uh, head of this Madarsa. 
so Hale takes this takes this decision to uh, punish Jay Jayeth after knocking uh, after you knowing that Maya uh, bought a pair of fancy sandals for him, which obviously goes against the idea of immaterialism which Islam professes. When Maya tries to intervene, he retorts aggressively by saying, "I need to spend more time at the mosque. Mosque. I can't watch over Jayeth." He needs guidance. We both know the situation is getting out of hand. And he makes up stories all the time. The boy lives in his own dream world. It is not right. Maya loses the argument and Sohail prepares Jade for his journey to the madrasa, making him wear a brand new lonely, a uh, half-sleeved kurta and a cap on his head. Uh, he's offered a small uh, trunk in his arms, which contains a comb, a stick of neem for his teeth, a crisp paste Quran, two new lungis and a chappal strapped in newspaper. Soon Maya gets to know that Jayad is facing sexual assault uh, in, the, in the madrasa, and she rushes to Sohail to tell this and asks him to bring back the child from that place. Uh, to her disappointment, obviously, Sohail remains least bothered about this matter. And though Maya you know, tries to save Jayad towards the end of the novel from the horror of uh, uh, the Huzur, uh, she unfortunately becomes the cause of his death, as the boat that she carries um, him in capsizes and sinks. Her decision to be his savior arises out of her distrust towards her brother and his religious fanaticism. But by causing such tragedy in her family, she also fails him to some extent. While earlier there was still room for the two to reach a common understanding, Zayed's death, Jayet's death turns out to be the symbol of a life, lifetime clash between the two. As Anam explains uh, towards the end of the story, finally there was some sense to it all, but it was too late. There could be no sense between them. He would remain as hallucination to her, the ghost of a man she used to love, and she would remain a stranger to him. That he was willing to accept this without also punishing her was enough. Jayat's death stands as the emblem of the failure of Bangladesh as a nation, which till date is caught between the stark polarities of Islamism and secularism. Anam has used this family feud to depict the plight of a nation, which fails to include both these sides into the stage representation. The conflict between the siblings represents the struggle of the nation to formulate a solidified national identity. The tragic end of the novel forewarns against the extremism of any sides and suggests a more inclusive approach in debates surrounding the secular and the religious. Only acceptance and mutual understanding can cater to this complication, leading to the idea of you know, nation and national identity. Anam highlights the complexities involved in such moderate approach, but then she is hopeful of that spirit, which is still not lost. Towards the end of the novel, we see a kind of understanding being built between um, Maya and Sohail. The epilogue of the novel, which opens in the year 1992, prophesizes this hope for a, peace, for a peaceful syncretism of these two conflicting sides. That's where um, Anam, you know, uh, says uh, or writes, uh, she misses him every day. She misses Jayad and Sohail. S she feels they sit here under her ribs and right next to her beating heart. And here at her temples and every time she closes her eyes and sees the picture of who Sohail has become, knowing that they will never go to cinemas or sit up at the table with Ammo or share a joke or a book, her heart will break. But she recognizes the wound in his history, the irreparable wound, because she has one too. His wound is her, her wound. Knowing this, she finds she can no longer wish him different. Among current, you know, uh, uh, so this is what, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's all about the talk and, uh, you know, uh, through these, you know, the relationship uh, of, you know, these siblings and how they, you know, are suddenly, you know, uh, they move apart uh, from each other and how, you know, back then uh, during the war, they both had similar kind of, you know, vision for the nation. But then in the aftermath of war, they take, you know, two completely, you know, different roads, right? And where we see, uh, you know, uh, like uh, the brother, you know, looking at uh, uh, his sister as his other and sister also doing, you know, a similar kind of sort of. So there is, you know, no, let's say, no space for conversation between the two because, they are, you know, caught up in this, you know, dichotomy of, as I said, you know, threatening, uh, you know, threatening self and threatening other, right? So, um, so that's what that is what you know, war does to this, you know, family, and uh, 
uh, and that you know this you know tragic you know death of the child towards the end of uh, the novel and also the title if you look at the title the good muslim the text you know nowhere tries to offer a definite let's say you know definition of i mean if we begin the text we also you know look for as readers we look for a maybe you know by the end of the novel we'll come with uh, come up with you know some understanding of you know who to categorize as a good muslim but then uh, the fact that you know uh, the novel ends uh, on it's it's a sort of you know open ended uh, sort of you can say um, a uh, novel so there also we don't get to uh, uh, you know uh, sort of you know see uh, i mean if a noun so maybe that is also a way to say that we need to look beyond these you know identity markers we need to you know look beyond these stereotypical you know definitions right uh, when it comes to sort of you know tag somebody as uh, you know good muslim bad muslim or who qualifies to be tagged as a true bangladeshi right based on religious i so so maybe you know that is uh, you know that that could you know one of the reasons why we do not get a definite answer towards the end of the novel uh, what is this you know the good muslim that anam tries to you know uh, sort of you know address uh, through the novel so um, that was you know my uh, textual analysis of uh, anam's book and uh, so now uh, Uh, if you have sort of any inputs uh, observations i just you know uh, uh, hand it to like uh, fatima if you would like to add something thank you ankita for that really insightful talk it was really refreshing to go back to anam and discuss uh, this really important work by her uh so i understood two things from your talk and since i am also familiar with anam's work uh you said that you find lack of empathy on maya's part when she doesn't want to understand her brother's take on on his own experiences uh, right uh and you see indifference you know on sohil's part when he doesn't want to understand um his sisters or his mother's emotions uh, and how they, they have worked so hard to bring everything back together mm. so uh, my uh, my analysis would be that uh, i think maya's failure lies in the fact that she thinks that once the war is over or once they have attained their so called freedom everything will remain same i mean they exactly. will go back to glorious days or or happy days or their childhood or whatever what she doesn't realize is the fact that war wounds everyone uh, in various degrees and nothing remains same so her failure or her lack of empathy i think um, lies in in this um, and uh, for sohail i would say that he he became so indifferent because of his own traumas or 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 his own crimes which we rarely discuss when it comes to wars uh, whether it's 1947 i mean in order to understand this war 1971 war we have to go back to uh, the partition i mean exactly. partition war, war between india and pakistan in 19 any yeah, of these you know, uh, incidents you know violent incidents that we uh, you know discuss in the context of the you know, south asia obviously the origin is partition you know because and that's why we say i mean is partition at all over right because back in again we go back to sort of you know uh, uncovering the same narrative to sort of you know, mobilize people using religion as a tool or you know uh, it's like you know, divisive sort of you know politics right so yeah. so, so, yeah, so maybe, his indifference his indifference has actually been politicized here because maya wants to blame religion for his indifference rather than uh, accepting the fact that something has happened to him as a human as a person or as a soldier mm-hmm. okay so that's very important here when we want to label someone as an extremist or um, or as as someone as a, as a secular person so these categories are very uh, what you would say uh, polemical categories and mm-hmm. it's not not only that it's not easy to define these categories but it can be very dangerous when we generalize things so exactly. um, maya's take on sohail that he has become an extremist is also uh, an extreme take exactly. and um, sohail's right. is also that's why extreme. you use these you know terms no like uh, if 
we are calling, you know, uh, I mean, how uh, Talal Asad and all these you know, theorists, they try to see secularism also enforced kind of, you know, secularism also as problematic because you are not allowing mm -hmm. people to practice their private faith, you know, to believe in their, you know, private religion, right? Because when we talk of, you know, secularism or a secular state, we know uh, at the heart of it, you know, lies the idea of distinguishing these two, you know, private faith and, you know, like the private from the public, you know, life. Right. But then here in the text, we see Maya constantly you know, trying to assert herself, trying to, you know, bring back or revive that past self of, uh, you know, Sohail. I mean, how he was used to be that rebellious, revolutionary sort of, you know, person. Uh, he himself used to, you know, condemn religion and all. Right. Or maybe it was the end of the novel. Um, why? I mean, the epilogue, you know, as I uh, referred to and that, you know, Anam mentions that uh, this is the place where, I mean, this is the moment in the text where, uh, uh, maybe you know Maya recognizes uh, the wound in Sohail's history because now she also has one too, right? So this is coming from this realization is coming from where? Maybe from the death of Jay, right? Because that also mm -hmm. the reason goes back to that point only where obviously mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, Sohail sent you know Jay to Madarsa because you know he thought you know that is the let's say uh, the proper let's say place to uh, get education right so maybe towards the end of the novel she also uh, you know goes through or maybe there is some kind of you know, guilt inside her that you know the death for uh, the death of you know, Jayat, somehow you know she blames herself and she knows that you know, Sohail is never going to forgive her for the death of uh, you know his son so now that yes. because she also has a history of you know loss you know this personal loss and uh, where she thinks that you know maybe i was you know responsible for that and that could be the reason, you know, she, uh, maybe it was the end of the novel, she tries to identify with, you know, Sohail because he also has that history of you know, killing an innocent person, right? And how he, uh, the weight of, you know, that guilt uh, is, is always, you know, there haunting him day in and out. And that's where, you know, religion becomes this, you know, recluse, right? That's where he seeks, you know, redemption. So, so obviously, I mean, uh, you can say, I mean, this whole idea of um, guilt, redemption, uh, this this sense of you know loss, right? Maybe it was the end of it that come we can say uh, you know brings these two ca characters you know, together, or maybe there is a hope for uh, a place, or maybe a, a sort of uh, reconciliation, maybe exactly hope reconciliation. For reconciliation. Yeah. yeah so um, at one instance, I mean, at somewhere in, in the middle or towards the end of the novel, um, because we those who who are familiar with Anam, they know that. Uh, um, Maya blames her brother's wife Sylvie for mm. this change. Okay, right. that she, because she is very religious, so she changed her hus husband. She made her husband into someone uh, who is an extremist. Uh, but towards the end of the novel, somewhere Sohail also says that you always blame Sylvie for mm. for all the changes, uh, mm. but Sylvie actually saved me. Okay, mm. or maybe her religious outlook, or I don't know what exactly. Sylvie actually saved me when you were busy killing all those unborn children. So right. uh, in, in Rajashahi, where she was a doctor, Maya, mm. she was actually giving abortions to women who were war victims, who war were victims. who became pregnant after pregnant after being raped by, by the soldiers, by Pakistan the Pakistani soldiers. soldiers. Right. Yeah. So he also has this kind of um, what you would say, um, this temperament and where he's blaming his sister. OK, so you were busy doing all those abortions while I was being saved by religion or by mm -hmm. my wife. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's so easy to, you know, kind of mold or manipulate religion to one's own self or some it becomes their savior for mm -hmm. For some, it becomes a political tool, or for some, it becomes a source of hatred, either mm. personal or political, doesn't matter. So this lack of empathy and this indifference, I mean, this this war between, uh, between these two emotions, um, religious emotions, we can say, I mean, safely, we can assume that, that's one of the powerful things that Anam uh, describes in the novel. And, and then another instance, like you said, like like Maya is very naive when she believes that everything can go back to the mm, previous normal. self, to the normal, to the previous self, which of course doesn't happen. And mm. when when she wants to ask Sohail about what happened to you, I mean, what happened with you during the war? What did you do or what happened with 
you what did they did to you so uh, so he is so wearied and so tired by her sister and you know the way she pressure pressurizes him all the time and there is one thing he says which is so powerful especially given what we are seeing in today's world and i quote from the text uh, we fought we won it didn't make a difference in the end Right. okay so it's like okay there was a war we fought that war we are now independent but there are so many things that need to be addressed, addressed. all the war crimes or and the current dictatorship in bangladesh and mm-hmm. the sheer poverty and so many things i mean it's not that you uh, you wage a war against something there are heroic tales and then you come up mm-hmm. as you know a brand new you don't become a brand new person or a country you are still wounded still traumatized and still um, a lot of healing has to happen mm. okay so this one line stayed with me when i reread the novel uh, we fought we won it didn't make a difference in the end so usually i don't know it's more like a, a capitalist gimmick or something it benefits some of course but then in the at end at the cost of what it. at the cost of what that is the question Yeah, exactly. It doesn't make any difference. It's just loss, losses after loss, loss trauma, loss, loss trauma. And it's not that you know that uh, I mean uh, it stays there in that moment, right? The repercussions are you know uh, you know you can say uh, felt years later. Like we are discussing about something that happened in 1971, exactly. but the reality hasn't changed much. Uh, and in the third, I mean, this is the second novel in her trilogy. In the third one, the failure of a nation state becomes even more pronounced. The Bones of Grace is the name. And we see that Anam's take in that novel is even more critical about this war and the poor and shabby state of Bangladesh and um, all the corruption, the dictatorship, all that. So it becomes... becomes even more pronounced there mm-hmm. so thank you thank you again for that really wonderful talk um now i open open the floor for for more discussions if you have any questions please uh please ask ankita or any comments okay. i think rajiv rajiv yeah. has to uh, say something okay thank you very much ankita it's a, it, it was a wonderful uh, presentation thank you um i i must admire your presentation and that is the beauty of literature uh, yeah. which cannot be expressed uh, directly mm-hmm. uh, you know literature becomes the medium and um, the uh, the sentiments and the feeling uh, you know uh, which carries a lot of things um, it reminded me uh, three things here uh, first uh, the 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 poem of uh, rudyard kipling uh, uh, the mm-hmm. white mind's burden Right. you know to 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 bring in the context of this you know good muslim mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and another uh, uh, the novel maybe many of you might be knowing the krista wolf uh, um, novel the get alter human it's a german uh, uh, novel uh, in english it is called uh, the div- uh, divided heaven mm-hmm. so it's again the this uh, tension between two identity Mm-hmm. one one the guy the guy it's a it's a love story again but the ideological tension also mm-hmm. and how this goes to the extreme level and then uh, separates two uh, uh, to two souls actually and then that's why is metaphoric like you know the divided he- heaven he- heaven mm-hmm. uh, it's a, it's a very very interesting thing that you have here pointed uh, and then i will be to- uh, talking about the third question uh, i will be asking you and uh, but before that i want to say something this uh, uh, you know <clears throat> the 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 the, the, the divided uh, heaven is about again the the the, the after the world war second the, the germany lost the uh, empire and um, the germany was divided into two uh, zones east and west and mm-hmm. capitalism and com- uh, socialism or communism mm-hmm. so the girl is from the uh, east germany and then mm. the uh, man is from the west germany and they meet uh, and then they fall in love and then they wanted to to marry because but because of um, the different uh, 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 ideological differences they divides they go uh, separate uh, uh. now here uh, the i want to go back to the rudyard kipling poem 
the white word, um, the white man burden. It's very interesting. Look at the the story of this story. The Muslim people have taken the, this burden of entire humanity. That goes to the extreme level. Mm -hmm. I mean, you it's you are uh, it's uh, and I'm not talking about the Muslim people, but the the when you talk about the good Muslim, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 so it's it becomes again the, it, it goes to the extreme level when you take the burden of the entire humanity that uh, you need to protect the, all human beings from the sin. Mm -hmm. It was in the time of the white man burdens when they were talking about like, you know, to, for the salvation that they will be giving the salvation to the all, entire humanity. And the black man was like, you know, how they were treated. They are mm -hmm. at least, uh, uh, they are at least growing the sugar cane and uh, feeding to us uh, uh, to get the salvation. At, le at least they get the salvation. Mm -hmm. Now the third point I want to ask you here and uh, when secularism is here, uh, in India, when we talk about in context of India, it's something different. Perhaps I'm not, uh, I'm not sure, and I want to talk to you, and I want to open the discussion about the secularism, when we talk about the secularism. The secularism, uh, Talal uh, uh, Ashad, uh, what he might have perceived, might have thought of Western, uh, Western notion of secularism. Exactly, when, exactly. When we talk about secularism in India, it's something different. Mm -hmm. It gives the space to the to the faith and religion to practice mm -hmm. and prosper. Mm -hmm. That is the beauty of India. I mean, talk about secularism, mm -hmm. and the, this is the very serious discussion in even uh, in our in, in when I'm I'm doing my PhD at the mm -hmm. University, and people mm -hmm. understand secularism in different way. They read mm -hmm. Allah uh, Asad, and then they talk about the secularism in that way. Mm -hmm. Now I want to ask you, and then uh, this question, and please uh, elaborate more on on this. Uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, this is obviously, as you said, uh, when I'm using, you know, Talal Asad, and this is primarily in the context of, you know, Bangladesh, because that was the, you can say, uh, the topic of my talk today. Uh, so that's why, you know, I brought his, uh, you can say, uh, you know, a reference here, because uh, when he's talk of, talking of, you know, he's defining the category of, you know, secular here, he's uh, taking it as, let's say, uh, I mean, uh, a Western sort of, you know, concept, you know, Western sort of, you know, import. And how uh, you know is at times you know used by the state as a tool to you can say, uh, legitimize let's say the uh, power of the modern state by establishing a clear cut sort of you know, boundary between the authority of the public sphere in opposition to the privatized sphere of the individual religious you know, practitioner and that's where the this whole conflict you know arises right because whenever we are saying that uh, there is you know when we are draw drawing this kind of you know, line between you know secular and the sacred right and we are saying that. Uh, you know, how, um, I mean, religion needs to be, you know, pushed more to, let's say, your private sort of, you know, sphere. But then in the case of, you know, Bangladesh, why, you know, it becomes important because um, there was, a, I mean, the whole idea of, you know, secularizing the nation primarily, you can say it entirely went against the uh, very essence of, you know, Bangladesh being, uh, you know, dominantly uh, Islamic sort of, you know, you can say a community, right? So you're forcing a different sort of, you know, uh, you know, culture, you're forcing different sort of, you know, belief system. And that's why I'm saying the concept of, you know, uh, you know, sacred, uh, you know, uh, you know, this one, secular fundamentalism is uh, more instrumental in the case of Bangladesh. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, it's the situation or case with whole of South Asia, because as you also pointed out, in India, we have a different understanding of, you know, uh, the concept of the secularism, where we, you know, allow, let's say, uh, where, where we say that we, we profess that, you know, we should have, you know, tolerance for all sorts of, you know, religious practices and you know, belief systems etc etc right but then uh the problem why in bangladesh is so more conflicting is because uh bangladeshi community i mean uh this whole as i said the tussle between bengali sort of you know identity and islamic identity right how you're trying to you know enforce certain set of you know certain you know aspect of an you know, identity to categorize people as you know true bangladeshi or true let's say you know citizens of you know bangladesh right so that is you know problematic and Talal Asad, you know, primarily, I think he's why I used his idea here is entirely in the context of, you know, Bangladesh, where uh, he obviously, you know, looks at uh, this, you know, conflict between uh, the siblings uh, and, you know, as a sort of, you know, criticism of modern conceptualization of the secular that always, you know, demands uh, for the separation of, you know, religion and insists for it to be privatized. Right. But then it's always a game of, you know, power. Right. I mean, your private is never, you know, severed from the political. 
right? And that's what Anam also, you know, tries to depict in this novel, right? It, like these two, you know, like within family and how, you know, using family as sort of an allegory for the nation itself, right? So whatever is happening in the outside domain, the repercussions are not just like sort of you know, located there. We see, I mean, these two siblings at one point of time, I mean, sharing uh, like, uh, you know, tea, coffee, you know, cracking jokes. And now they are not even, uh, like they're not even able to strike a conversation. They're not even able to understand each other. Right. So, uh, so I, I'll agree to you, you know, Raju, uh, because uh, this concept of the you know, secularism as uh, as an imported sort of you know concept, as a more sort of Western concept. Uh, I mean, I would like to. I mean, my intention was to criticize it in the context of you know Bangladesh, but they're not. I'm not you know trying to imply it in the like the whole of you know when it comes to like address the whole of you know, South Asia, right? Because in in India we know like it has a completely different sort of you know uh, connotation, right? So. Uh, if that you know addressed uh, your question, uh, Rajiv. Yes, Fatima, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, interestingly, um, in the novel itself, we see different kinds of Islam. I mean, not different kinds of Islam, but different ways in which people practice Islam. So Maya is recalling the way villagers used to, you know, pray which is not, which won't be tolerated by, by Jamaat Islam, Jamaat Islami people or other, other, other sects. Uh, so she was like, there are so many ways to, you know, pray to, um, pray to God, pray to Allah or to practice Islam and hardliners kind of reduce it to just one single uh, entity that like you have to uh, pray in this way, pray in that way. That's why she's critical of that sister also, that Khadija sister who stays with them upstairs. So some of the criticism is valid, actually, what Maya says. It's not, it, uh, not everything can be, I mean, everything she criticizes cannot be discarded because some of them is, uh, some of that is valid. Uh, so it, it opens up, I mean, discussions on who makes, who uh, is a who makes who qualifies as a good Muslim? Exactly. And who gets Jamaat to decide? Islami that. version. Yeah. Uh, Jamaat Islami version that Sohail gives us, yeah. or it's uh, the, the villagers. In I mean, they, I mean, they make songs, you know, and they sing songs using Quranic verses, something like that they do. Now mm -hmm. I am remembering that. So. Mm -hmm. I, uh, but Jamaat Islami people will be very critical of that. I mean, how can you sing? Singing is haram in Islam and all that. So uh, Anam is actually very, is being very paradoxical here. She is not talking just about the war, but she, she is more objective here. I mean, what do you get, get out of all these? Uh, all this, I mean, so it's like who qualifies for a good Muslim? So Hail or, or, or Maya? who actually criticizes religion um, being used as a political tool or, or those who are not part of that war, but still they practice Islam in their own ways. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like a vast ocean. <laughs> we can go on and on and on, but, but it, uh, uh, it compels us to ask a few pertinent questions. I mean, uh, to become... Uh, compels us to become more empathetic, more tolerant, and um, and more patient with people, with their experiences, um, and also compels us to ask questions that we should be asking, like uh, uh, war crimes, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She she keeps on talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, those who committed crimes during the war, they must be punished. Uh, I mean. All those things we should be questioning, and in and in the current scenario, I mean, uh, Rajiv and I were having a conversation about it, and which is so important. We it's not enough to say prayers for Ukraine or prayers for this country or prayers for that country. We must be questioning the whole idea of such big investments in military. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I mean, as individuals, we cannot do much. We cannot go and help people in Ukraine or stop Russia, you know, or uh, we are not that powerful. We might not sound that powerful as individuals, but then we should be asking why uh, nations, even though they are now 
clear cut nations with clear cut borders and laws and regulations why why are they still investing in arms and military uh, i mean what is what are we getting out of all this only violence trauma mm. Yeah. common people like this they are getting all it is some people who are in power i mean we should be questioning people in power and their intentions and and of course we should talk about the ways in which we can create a better world for all of us hmm. and i think exactly and that's what you that's know that's how anna was talking from from a family to a more generic uh, world view from pessimism from war to like you said towards mm. optimism and exactly that's what you know uh, the novel also tries to uh, in a way explore uh, that you know whenever we talk of let's say um, uh, history of you know any kind of you know, war we get to sort of you know hear all these heroic stories right of of you know stories of you know valor etc etc but then what about these ordinary let's say you know citizens you know individuals sort of your stories right and that's why you know she's using family here you know this one sort of you know a uh, very close sort of you know space unit to resemble you know whatever is happening in the outside domain and uh, so that's why it's important to talk about you know ordinary experiences it's important to talk about individual you can say uh, experiences of you know trauma of loss right because uh, when we talk of let's say the official history of you know officially you know let's say uh, discourses of nationalism right we never get to hear these stories right and that's why i also you know pointed out that this is one of the major interventions uh, you know by anam because uh, if you look at the first uh, set of you know let's say uh, uh, writings which came from you know bangladesh they were all about you know heroic let's say uh, songs of war etc etc and uh, one aspect also which you know anam tries to highlight is the uh plight of the biranganas right the the war yes, heroes exactly. and that's quite you know significant here and how they were sort of you know always excluded from the official narrative of you know uh, bangladeshi sort of you know uh, nationhood right so these women obviously uh, the political let's say leaders they will go out and say that you know um, impress these women you know bring them back to your houses and all but then there was a very systematic sort of you know process of ostracization against these you know women right they were not you know, accepted by so you are just you know, just for the sake of you know um like you just you know offered them or maybe uh, uh, conferred them with this you know title or you know tag we wrong in us you know that's like the war heroes right revolutionaries then, yeah. exactly but then they could they like really uh, you know get that recognition in the society it did not right so that mm-hmm. is also you know one of the and that's why you know the novel is quite interesting because she is uh primarily you know, focusing on all these you know individual you know narratives of you know trauma of you know systematic you know discrimination of laws etc right and not just you know, going by your so that is also a way to critique the official you can say this course of national exactly it's a, it's also right. revisiting the you know the notion of identity and uh, Hmm. Uh, nation I'm formation you know, nationalism nation how, do form- we cons- exactly. yeah, how do we consolidate so, i would net- like to add something here when you say biranguna i'm reminded of babsi sidwa um, mm-hmm. she's a farsi writer mm-hmm. and when they were talking about these women who were raped by um, um, by um, by who but i mean during the partition of india and pakistan so these raped women uh, they were not accepted in their homes and of course outside also they didn't find any acceptance so these were called like kind of leftover leftover women of the war leftover product of the war and these identities like birongna they are imposed on them they are not exactly. asking for it they didn't want to be just part to of their, their, just war. to silence their just to silence their own narratives of you know um, whatever like uh, sexual or you know uh, while they went through and how a woman's body was you know so much more than that you easily be used as a tool you know for both the parties you know you talk of you know bengali uh, like in the case of you know bangladesh you know, liberation war so east pakistan west pakistan obviously women always is the target of it right because she carries the honor of let's say any specific you know country so why you violate the body of a woman you are you violate the entire country right yeah. so, so like you so, conquer the entire country at least exactly right yeah at least metaphorically, metaphorically. Uh, or i mean um, one of the saddest things uh, which had come into my mind was that these women were touched by too many men hmm. okay so this identity of being touched by too many men and therefore now they are the fallen women somehow hmm. so this identity it's so painful like something something like that can be imagined or imposed on anyone and that really 
that is not question i mean i mean mm-hmm. during any kind of war what the military is doing to mm-hmm. uh, to the women or or that is rarely rarely discussed in uh, mainstream history or in mainstream and that's yeah. why i think these women writers are you know important to read you talk of you know urvashi bhutalia and the other side of you know silence and how she you know tries to record all these you know individual stories um, of you know women uh, there right and here we have your tanmit khan and that's why you know, they in some other way to try to you know you can say uh, focus more on these excluded you know stories you know narratives mm-hmm. Uh, and 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 you know and now yeah exactly it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, that what what you said it's a, it's a voice of a woman also right uh, i mm-hmm. mean you know because um, it has always been the voice of male mm-hmm. or men because uh, when we talk of the i mean the concept of history also we say it his his story right so exactly. so women they are trying to talk about you know her story yeah exactly uh, Right. So, yeah. Nahid Aslam, would you like to say something? You have been posting quite a few interesting comments over there. Would you like to speak up? Uh, Hello, Aslam. I don't really have Nahid. to. I'm just listening to what you're saying and just making comments on that. I haven't read the book, so I don't really. Okay, but really still, still if you want to speak, if you want to say something, you are more than welcome. Please do. Uh no I just I find it very interesting to know about what is happening within the Indian subcontinent just now and I was very mindful of uh, somebody had said uh, earlier on that uh, you know the the british divided the lands up mm. you no know, we accepted the 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 the, the um, borders that they created but nobody mm-hmm. is doing anything to undo those borders mm. i mean what is, what is stopping bangladesh from reuniting with india mm. what is um, apart from the religion maybe what is stopping pakistan from joining with afghanistan if it feels like it's got much more in common with afghanistan than it does with india you know mm-hmm. the borders were created by britain and africa mm-hmm. as well i mean if you look at africa the, all the borders that, that were that are there the artificial borders created by the europeans but why are the Af- why are the africans not uh dismantling those borders you know why why are the uh, ex colonized countries not saying well you know we've had enough of this uh these are artificial borders uh, we want to reunite with our people because um, we, because i think nahid we have like different uh you know faces now for the for those colonizers right so <laughs> in yeah, i mean if you talk about south asia or the political leaders people who are in power right so we have it's the system is same you have different faces you know you have different sort of you know mechanisms different sort of you know structures there but then as you highlighted i mean why can't we just you know undo that and question that we are not doing that we are simply trying to do more politics you know over uh, the whole idea of you know border formation etc etc professor Professor Day uh, is with us. Uh, Professor Day, welcome. Uh, would you like to say something? Hello, Professor. Professor Day. It's good to see you again. I think uh, Professor Day is muted, or perhaps um, is not convenient. So yeah, what what he uh, he was uh, she was saying, um, Naid Aslam. Um, where are you from, Naid? I'm Punjabi. You're from Punjab. Living, wow. living in Britain, though. Okay, it's great. Uh, so it's a very. Jamil, good... you wanted to say something. Jamil, Lamar. Yeah, uh, I had okay, a question. Just, just a minute. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, and then I will come back, back to you directly, Jamil. And then I think we are out of time. Also. Is, uh, close to my heart because uh, my family uh, came long back uh, from. Uh, Astwali is Pakistan that is Bangladesh so we know what is there what is going on and the 71 war we supported wholeheartedly uh, bangladeshis uh, and that celebrated the victory but uh, whatever happened before 71 and after 71 is very painful very very painful and tahmina has uh, opened up the wounds once again so i am concerned but then Uh, yeah this kind of discussion is uh, required it's very rarely talked about these women these so called quote unquote foreign women uh, who has been raped again and again and again and again by the 
uh, Pakistani army. I mean, they are, uh, yeah, they just call them Biranganas, but then that has no value. And uh, the religious divide, let us not talk about it, it's, it's a huge, it's huge there. I mean, uh, so Pakistan is all, I mean, Bangladesh is always in our heart. Um, and uh, as I said, these kind of discussions opens up the wounds for us. But we must discuss it because there is no other way to solve the issues uh, uh, that are at stake, particularly the position of women, position of minorities, not only the Hindus of Bangladesh, but also the other minorities, the Buddhists of, uh, of uh, Tetragram, the Chittagong area, Buddhists, and mm -hmm. the Santals and other tribals. So whatever I get to hear from my friends in Bangladesh, things are not very good. But of course, there are a group of people uh, in different universities, the student group and other groups who are very much uh, forward looking, they're very much, uh, what do you call, conscious, but then they are the minority. Mm -hmm. so, so I think this discussion should go on. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, so does I anyone else? Jamil, uh, uh, Jamil. Yeah, no. Jamil, yes. Ah, Jamil. Is, Sorry, uh, Jamil. Yeah, it's all right. So uh, I had a question. I have not read uh, the novels of uh, uh, the writer mm -hmm. on a discussion. Yeah, but I had a question to ask because uh, the novels which she wrote, uh, I mean, had the, has the backdrop of uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Right? So my question is because you people were talking about uh, religion, right? Uh, my question is, uh, where does the this play of uh, language stand against this this idea of religion when it comes to uh, this liberation of uh, a country? I guess I mean uh, the the author has discussed in one of her novel about uh, this because uh, uh, when I was just going through uh, some things and I I just read that. Uh, in the first novel of uh, for the writer, uh, A Golden Age, mm -hmm. uh, how uh, the mother uh, struggles to uh, relate with her children, right? And like her children who were born in uh, Bangladesh, so uh, how the how how the language connects them uh, with the idea of nationalism. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Bangladesh, where at one end uh, uh, there is a I mean Muslims in in majority. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to understand this shared proportion of la language and, and religion uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, so um, I don't think, I mean, uh, that was the whole, you know, propaganda, you know, to connect. I mean, on the one hand, on the one hand, you had, you know, like these uh, secular sort of, you know, um, you know, idea proposed by the Bengali sort of, you know, uh, you can say uh, Muslims and on the other hand, like West Pakistan entirely sort of. So Urdu, you know, uh, primarily in Urdu speaking, you know. So uh, obviously, when we are talking about the Bangladesh Liberation War, language was at the core of it. You know, that was one of the you can say major, uh, you can say uh, points of you can say uh, uh, conflict between these two sides. But then uh, language here is also not used. I mean, uh, as a neutral sort of an entity, right? That we just you know, obviously these like religious connotations, right? Cultural connotations. They are very much, you know, embedded there, right? And we have to you know, look at the nexus of, you know, language, religion, ethnicity. There, there are so many, you know, let's say, you know, aspects, right? And they all, you can say, when uh, it's war time, you see people, you know, using all sorts of, you know, propaganda, right? And they'll try to use, like, especially, uh, especially, you know, those tools which help them, you know, mobilize the masses on a large scale, right? So obviously, I mean, language, religion, ethnicity. All these are, you can say, quite you know, connected, right? And in the case of, you know, Bangladesh Liberation War, this language, I mean, the whole, you can say, politics of language was you know, not rid from, not rid of, let's say, uh, uh, the religious connotation, right? Because on the one hand, you know, Bengali culture, then, you know, like the, the Muslim culture, and the whole tussle is between the Bangladeshi and Bengali identity and Islamic identity, how to sort of, you know, uh, uh, bring these identities. Why I ask this? Because uh, my experience has been uh, quite different. Like, Let's say in India, I'm talking about in, in a campus wherein we have students from different states speaking different mm. language. Mm. So suppose in, in a group, oh, there are students uh, speaking Bengali. Mm. Okay. So mm. uh, uh, let's say uh, there are Muslims and Hindus and people of other religion. 
so i bengali i'm a muslim my first uh, i mean my first language is urdu i don't speak bengali let's say that so a, a bengali will prefer to be with somebody who speaks bengali uh, regardless of which religion he or she belongs to right so uh, uh, i was wondering was religion a unifying force in a bangladesh celebration or the religion language or religion see uh, again jamil uh, we have to uh, read it in the context of uh, like different situations or you know incidents that we are talking about so in a, like let's say if you're talking of you know day to day sort of you know uh, you know uh, sort of uh, i mean our like everyday sort of you new know, reality right so as you know brought up brought up the let's say the reference of you know classroom sort of an you know, engagement right so we are not in war sort of you know situation here it's more like a safe place you have you know people coming from different parts of india different and uh, we are there like in jnu we have like you know uh, we, our department is called you know center for english studies but then the department is so much you know, dominated by bengalis i mean <laughs> so i mean we used to sort of you know practice joke you know like chase the Uh, and at times, I mean, there is this kind of an hegemony in the language that you can feel, you know. Yes, it's very good. So we also have to see what kind of a situation we are dealing with, because when it's war time, people they do not think rationally, right? You use all these, you know, markers, all these let's say, you know, tools to brainwash them, right? So you just look for those uh, markers, those you know, tools, uh, which you can, you know. Uh, i mean which you can simply use to activate the sentiments of your people right so language is very much a part of who we are right it's very much a part of our identity and connected to that is obviously i mean religious practices right otherwise i mean if you uh, uh, and why you know as fatim also said that you know, when we are talking of the bangladesh liberation war we can't we can't simply start from there we have to trace the root uh, back to the partition right and partition obviously the religion aspect was very much not there right so there are you know all these branches you know sub branches and all these you can say uh, you know the like categories or you know identity markers they are you know, quite connected to each other and that's when you know, people especially when you are in a war 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 sort of you know, situation people deliberately want to uh, you can say uh, use such you know tools to connect to people uh, on let's say in terms of you know uh, on sentimental sort of you know level right because uh when it when it's about sentiments your reason or rationality does not does not work right and for what and in what like situation you need such kind of mentality where you are not uh, simply like you know thinking rationally you are simply driven by let's say all these you know blind forces or you know blind sort of you know emotion sentimentalism so people will you know invoke the idea of you know nationalism right so our country versus uh, you know their country right so us versus them sort of the dialect you know all this in the context of you playing and she also Right, so why people are saying that now that you see all the citizens are taking up arms, so majority of them in their statement they say that it's my home, right? I'm a part of in this place, right? So it's more about the spatial, you know, construction and how they relate themselves to this the, the space, right? It's not that you know I want I have been a soldier or I want war, but then when it comes to defending your home, right? And home is something all of us are quite you know, let's say uh, you're protective about, right? So so that's why. that uh, it's important to look at what kind of situation we are dealing with and all these you know uh, identity markers then they you know begin to make different sort of you know sense right so in a normal situation you can have a group of people like bengali like speaking people urdu speaking people right but then that would be a different kind of your setup but then in very squad like situation you know like you know these things can mean a lot right and they can be used as you know political tools to sort of you know, mobilize people Uh, you know, just simply trigger uh, them or push them to, you know, commit acts of, you know, violence in the name of language, in the name of religion, in the name of, you know, uh, any kind of, you know, identity, in the name of nationalism, etc., etc. Right. So that's why the context is important. The situation is important. Uh, okay. So I think we are pretty much done here, <laughs> and we can now wrap up the discussion. Uh, Rajiv. Yes, um, thank you very much, Ankita and uh, Fatma, and all the audience who are still like for long hour tuned with this um, talk. Uh, we we are having the series of um, talks uh, on this uh, theme: identity, violence. You know, uh, it, when we talk about violence, we really need to talk about again and again, but because 
<laughs> violence in itself is a, a very complicated word you know when it becomes violence okay mm. and so what, what sort of you know violence we are talking about exactly. you know, physical violence psychological violence, violence, psychological right? violence. systemic exactly. violence uh, domestic so violence state sponsored <laughs> violence which is yeah, rarely talked about violence. it's not like exactly. yeah, different forms yes. so uh, yeah i mean for example um, you know it's uh, also violence becomes like a uh, uh, minority living in the majority uh, country the community mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it also can be violence also uh, mm-hmm. because uh, it becomes very sensitive mm-hmm. issue like you know because uh, psychology it's, it's it's a psychology because they feel uncomfortable living in a uh, majority community and then mm-hmm. they they feel uh, even they are not oppressed or suppressed they feel suppressed they need some some sort of, sort of uh, you know uh, communication so so we, violence also opens the door of communication mm-hmm. uh, whether it's a man and woman because uh, when we talk about violence of um, Um, uh, you know then we, we need to talk about we need to come in dialogue like you know what is happening then then we we need to establish a dialogue uh, mm-hmm. else it becomes a violence so uh, it's a it's a great talk that we have initiated and uh, i mean i i actually i read this um, uh, uh, the novel i think i'm i i'm adding in my uh, <laughs> uh, 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 bibliography <laughs> it's going to be another uh, um, uh, reference for my phd um, research project uh, so thank you very much ankita and uh, we uh, we have another session that is uh, going to be on um, i think uh, um, fatma can you share the umran group uh, whatsapp group on this or sad swasti can you share in the chat so they can mm-hmm. join uh, it will be easy to communicate with them whenever we have updates uh, um, discussion uh, you are tuned with then uh, our talks swasti you can share the whatsapp link yes, in the chat yes box. yes so so I'm doing um, that. Our next talk mm-hmm. is going to be uh, on um, uh, March. Uh, it is going to be a two days webinar uh, series of talks again. Or one day. March one day or two days. Two days. It's uh, Saturday and Sunday. You are and your uh, friend. Uh, no, that's in April. That's in April. Sharoni and I. Uh, Mahi's talk is in March. and Ma- it's one day seminar yes yes okay okay i'm sorry um, mahi and uh, professor um uh, um uh, mosmiji benerji is going to moderate the mm-hmm. session and yeah. is uh, again we are talking so so the theme is of theme of our um, umran academic research association uh, is again identity violence and cons- conscience uh, yes you know to become aware of something you know Uh, then we can reduce the uh, the violence <laughs> when we are aware then we can reduce the uh, violence um and um, uh, uh, one more thing that i want to uh, add here that uh, umran academic research associations are conducting um, talks on regular basis uh, uh, we are publishing also papers uh, we have um, umran magazine uh, recently we launched the project uh, you can uh, uh, umran uh, uh, women's magazine uh, if anything related mm-hmm. to the women studies uh, gender Uh, you can send us. Uh, you can visit our page website and send your uh, articles. Even po- you can share the poetry. You can share the paintings, women's paintings. Okay, uh, uh, photography. We need a ph- photography also. Uh, okay, so done by the woman. Uh, photography also is required. So uh, there are a lot of things that you can share, and we can. Pu- we are going to publish in our uh, uh, magazine, uh, which will be quarterly published. we have editor very renowned uh, uh, we have the board of editorial board uh, and professor from different part of the world uh, india um, from turkey and from uh, uk uh, united states so we have the uh, editors uh, we are working very hard on this project um, another project that we have uh, you can become uh, umran academic research association uh, member also uh, and uh, we will be also in future we are looking for that we can provide uh, scholarship to the research students so we are working on that uh, and if you are interested you can join become a member uh, and uh, uh, stay tuned with the uh, the videos okay. yeah well, i'm already following your page uh, okay <laughs> very much a participant here uh, and it's really i mean you are doing such a great work uh, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Gita. Thank you again. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This was a lovely evening. I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you.
Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Yeah, yes. Good evening. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is Neha. Yes, Hi, Neha. Uh, yes, ma'am. Good, ev good evening. It was a great session with you, sir and ma'am. And right now, I am doing my research on Tahmima Anam. The okay. Tahmima Anam's book, uh, <laughs> The Good Muslim and the Golden Age. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I am going going to do a comparative studies uh, with uh, her novel, with uh, Natasha Cole's novel, Reset You, mm -hmm. and the future tense. Right. So uh, I read uh, these two novels, mm -hmm. and I, <laughs> uh, in your talking, I've got a great idea about uh, these novels, and uh, right now I am pretty much, I have a confidence that I am able to write my papers and publish my papers <laughs> because of you all. <laughs> We'll surely do, Neha. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that I could just, you know, uh, inculcate that interest. Uh, so if you need any kind of, you know, help related to, you know, like a reading list, you know, bibliography and all, so you can always write to me uh, because I have also, you know, I'm also you know, working on Anna uh, as part of my, you know, PhD work. So yeah, you can always you know, write to me if you need any kind of you know, help. On that uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank okay. you for your golden okay. words. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for Thank having you. Me. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.